So welcome everyone to the Remembrance Month virtual lecture series. This is the second one that we've had this year. Um, I'm going to start off by doing our land acknowledgement. Um, so I'm going to do the land acknowledgement on behalf of the Simcoe County Museum. So the County of Simcoe acknowledges that the land on which we gather today is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek Nation, which includes the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. We also recognize the Huron-Wendat who occupied these lands prior to the middle of the 17th century. We embrace the enduring presence and partnership of the Indigenous peoples of this region, including the Chippewa Tri Council First Nations, comprised of the Beausoleil First Nation, the Chippewas of Rama, and the Georgina Island First Nation. We would also like to recognize the diverse Métis and Inuit communities within our region. The County of Simcoe is dedicated to honoring our Indigenous history and culture and is committed to coming together to learn and heal and create future prosperity, respect, and understanding in all of our communities. So as I said, welcome everybody to our Remembrance Month virtual lecture series. Um, my name is Meredith Patterson and I actually have the pleasure of introducing our, our speaker today. So our speaker today is Mark Zelke. He is best known as the award-winning author of the Canadian Battle series, each volume of which focuses on a battle or campaign fought by the Canadian Army in World War II. There are currently 13 books in the series, along with a companion title, Through Blood and Sweat, a Remembrance Trek Across Sicily's World War II Battlegrounds, which combines history and memoir to relate the poignant and grueling story of a group of Canadians, including Mark, who walked in the footsteps of the 1st Canadian Infantry Division in the commemoration of the 70th anniversary of Operation Husky, the Allied invasion of Sicily. The 13th title in the series is The River Battles, Canada's final campaign in World War II Italy, a detailed account of the last five brutal months of fighting in the Emilia Romagna region that concluded our Army's operations in Italy. He is currently at work on a new Canadian battle series title focused on Canada's role in the war with Japan entitled The Maple Leaf versus the Sun. The Canadian battle series is recognized as the most extensive account of any National Army's involvement in World War II written by a single author. In 2006, holding Juno Canada's heroic defense of the D-Day beaches won the City of Victoria Butler Book Prize. Mark is the proud recipient of the 2014 Governor General's History Award for Popular Media, Media and the Pierre Burton Award. He lives in Victoria with partner and fellow writer Francis Backhouse. So I'm actually going to pass that on over to Mark and he's going to do his presentation. So I'll pass it on over to you, Mark. Okay, thank you. Um, hopefully you are seeing a screen now that says on to victory, the liberation of Holland. And uh, that's the um, title of the first book that we're going to be talking about. This presentation is based on several volumes of my Canadian battle series with on to victory being the title that ultimately bookends the story I'm going to relate here today. In the Netherlands, the spring of 1945 is still remembered as the sweetest of springs. From March 23rd to May 4th, 1st Canadian Army pushed ever deeper into Holland, liberating one community after another during its hard-fought march through the country. Each time our soldiers entered a community, whether it was big or small, they were met by throngs of Dutch civilians wild with joy at having suddenly gained freedom after five years of Nazi occupation. This account by a Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry Officer of the approach to an entry into Amsterdam sets out the scene as it played out repeatedly across the country. Every village, street and house was bedecked with the red, white and blue Dutch flags and orange streamers, which in the bright sunlight made a gay scene. The Dutch people lined the roads and streets in thousands to give us a great welcome. Wherever the convoy had to slow up for a roadblock or a bridge, hundreds of people waved, shouted, and even fondled the vehicles. There's actually a Bren carrier buried underneath all those kids. When the convoy reached the outskirts of Amsterdam, it lost all semblance of a military column. A vehicle would be unable to move because of all the civilians surrounding it, climbing on it, throwing flowers, bestowing handshakes, hugs, and kisses. One could not see the vehicles or the trailer for legs, arms, heads, and bodies draped all over it. When the Seaforth Highlanders of Canada arrived in Amsterdam a little later to take up occupation duties, that there they received a similarly rapturous welcome. 
because their house was immediately next to Vondelspark, um, where the Highlanders set up camp. The teenage Margaret Blaze was sent by her father to give them a welcome. And as she went out the door, he warned, whatever you do, don't fall in love with any of them. They're all going back to Canada and you're staying right here in Amsterdam, girl. The first Canadian Marguerite set eyes on was tall and slender. She approached him boldly. My parents would be thrilled if you come to the house so we can thank you for the liberation, she said. Lieutenant Wilf Gildersleeve gathered up a few men from his platoon, and they went over for a visit. Seeing how little food the family had, he returned with another officer that night, heavily burdened with compo rations, boxes to give them. Who's at the door, Marguerite's father asked when she answered. Two men in skirts, she replied. She had never seen men wearing kilts before. Images and anecdotes such as these are those we most often picture and which are a touchstone for understanding the nature of the enduring friendship that exists between Canada and the Netherlands. But behind the memory of collective euphoria over a nation's freedom restored and war ending in allied victory, there exists a more complex story. It's a story of a two-phased liberation a story of a nation teetering on the brink of starvation that led to a race against time and a clandestine negotiation between the Allies and German occupiers of the Netherlands to provide crucial aid in time to avert a humanitarian catastrophe. It is also the story of the common Canadian soldiers for whom the spring of 1945 was at best bittersweet. For as each of those last 48 days of the war passed, each soldier feared, faced the fear that he or his friends might be among the last to die before the war ended. I mentioned that the liberation of Holland was a two-phased one. This is something that often gets forgotten in the popular memory. For while the rest of the Netherlands ended up waiting until the last 48 days of the war for liberation, the majority of the three southern provinces of Limburg, Zeeland, and North Brabant were freed from German occupation in fall 1944. In September 1944, the Allies closed on the country's southern border, and when British troops entered Antwerp, the German occupation forces in Holland panicked and a mass evacuation seemed imminent to the Allies and to the Dutch government in exile, which was watching events from London. Allied intelligence reports fed the expectation, predicting that by October 1st, the Germans would quit Holland entirely and withdraw into Germany. But instead of thrusting directly out of Antwerp, to clear the Scheldt estuary to open the great port to Allied shipping. An advance that would have positioned the British Canadian forces for a rapid push into the heart of the Netherlands. General Bernard Montgomery, pictured in the middle here, redirected the British Second Army eastward to launch Operation Market Garden with the fellow on the right hand, not wearing a hat, uh, Lieutenant General Brian Horrocks leading that charge. And the other fellow in the picture here is Prince Bernard of uh, the Dutch government. Market Garden entailed the British 30th Corps that Monty had withdrawn from Antwerp on September 7th to drive from near Pelt down at the bottom of this map in Belgium, up a 60 mile stretch of road to cross the Rhine River at Arnhem, up at the top where the uh, purple um, emblem of the uh, Pegasus um, of the 6th Airborne Division is shown. Um, that's my place. Vital bridges, the combined tank and infantry force would have to cross were to be captured by airborne troops in three drops. First, the U.S. 101st Airborne Division just north of Eindhoven, and then the U.S. 82nd Airborne near Nijmegen, finally the British 1st Airborne Division at Arnhem itself. The operation was launched on September 17th. It quickly ran into trouble when German resistance proved far stronger than anticipated and 30th Corps was soon far behind schedule. The airborne drops went largely as planned, but again, resistance at the bridges proved stronger than expected. In Arnhem, the British Perez were soon facing overwhelming numbers of Germans and their tenuous hold on the famous bridge too far there was ultimately lost. 
In the aftermath, however, a small civil sliver of Holland extending north to Nijmegen had been liberated. The launch of Market Garden had the unintended effect, effect of calming German occupation forces in the Netherlands. This resulted in a quick realignment of troops to offer a determined defense of the Scheldt estuary and its approaches to deny the Allies the use of the uh, port of Antwerp, which is on the right-hand corner of your map at the, um, at the bottom there. And you can see the water body, the West Scheldt, uh, running into there, uh, very narrow, and the Germans are on both sides of that and so able to put up a, a huge defense. As a result, First Canadian armies forced into a costly and grinding campaign stretches from late September to early November. The Breskens Pocket, Leopold Canal, Albert Canal, Operation Switchback, Von Streck, South Beveland Peninsula, Valkren Causeway, Operate Infatuate, all become part of the Canadian Army's lexicon for the war. At the campaign's end, the approaches to Antwerp via the Scheldt Estuary are finally opened, but at a terrible price. First Canadian Army suffers nearly 13,000 casualties, and of these, almost half are Canadians killed, wounded, or missing. That story is set out, by the way, in my first book on the Holland Liberation, Terrible Victory. But it is an important background to understanding how the story of the liberation of the rest of Holland and the tragedy of the hunger winter unfolded. The story that is at the heart of On to Victory and our purpose here today. For in the aftermath of the Schalt Estuary campaign, a significant part of the Netherlands stands free of German occupation. And throughout the rest of the country, expectations are running high that the Canadians are immediately going to advance to liberate the rest of Holland. The tragedy that is about to befall the still occupied majority of the Netherlands began to unfold even as the Scheldt Estuary campaign was only just beginning to develop. September 5th, 1944, this photo was taken on that day, is remembered in Holland as Mad Tuesday. With British troops in Antwerp and the occupying Germans panicking, rumors swirled throughout the country that Allied troops were racing northward. Hearing that a community called Breda had been freed and mistaking the Dutch city in Brabant province for a nearby hamlet just outside of Amsterdam, Thousands took to the streets on the city's southern entrance. They gathered with bunches of flowers hidden under their coats, waiting for the liberators to arrive. Night passed. In the sober light of morning, it was only too apparent that wishful, th wishful thinking had had its fling. Instead, the Germans retrenched the Scheldt Estuary campaign began, and the Dutch are subjected to ever-escalating levels of repression. A scorched earth policy using water instead of fire was implemented and between 500,000 and 800,000 acres of polders, the farmland is contained by dikes, was deliberately inundated that took 10% of the country's agricultural land out of production. This reduced the country's food production by 15 to 20%. German engineers also crippled Rotterdam's huge port by destroying its cranes and docks. Hoping to stem the destruction by hampering German movement of men and supplies, the government in exile in London called for a national railway strike. On September 17th, 28,000 of 30,000 railway workers walked off the job. Most joined the many thousands of other Dutch citizens already living underground, known as the underdunkers, to avoid arrest. The strike remained in effect to the end of the war as this monument outside Den Dalder railway station commemorates. Reich Commissar Arthur Seiss Inquart, uh, uh, who's the person pictured second from the uh, left uh, with the uh, German hat, and the other guys are all British uh, officers after he'd been arrested. He was the uh, German appointed Austrian governor of the Netherlands. He struck back immediately and viciously. Shipments of food from one part of the country to the other, particularly from the agriculture regions to the large cities of Western Holland were barred. Movement of anything by barge along the canal ceased and many of the barges were removed to Germany. So too were vast amounts of machinery from factories, vehicles, anything else that could be of use to Germany. 
of the nation's 8 million ubiquitous bicycles, half, 4 million in all, were confiscated and sent to Germany. The Netherlands quickly descended into a crisis of food shortages, made worse by the rapid exhaustion of heating fuel supplies and other essentials. By the first weeks of 1945, the hunger winter had descended fully upon the country. 16 to 20 percent of Dutch civilian deaths will be due to starvation. And it was a situation that escalated rapidly with the passing weeks. German and Allied intelligence reports reached the same conclusions that by mid-April, 3.5 million Dutch would be on the verge of death by starvation. Seizinkwart, having masterminded the hunger winter out of rage at Dutch defiance, now realizes he's the architect of what could become the most disastrous humanitarian crisis to occur in Western Europe as a result of the German occupation. But the damage is done. The infrastructure is so destroyed that only Allied intervention and bringing of relief can stave off the situation. Against this urgently developing backdrop, the Allies had spent the winter holding a mostly static front because of a lack of resources, bad weather, and then staving off the German offensive that became known as the Battle of Britain, of the, of the Bulge, sorry. The Canadians spent this period initially engaged in the watch on the Mass River patrolling their section of liberated Holland and watching the Germans do the same on the river's other shore. Then came the decisive offensive by 1st Canadian Army in February to clear the western banks of the Rhine River from Nijmegen to Zanten in Germany. This is the topic of the middle book in the Victory Trilogy that tells the story of the liberation of the Netherlands. Known as the Rhineland, this area was a narrow sliver of Germany on the south bank of the Rhine River that bordered parts of Belgium and France. It was a mix of open farmland and dense forests, the largest being the Reichswald, which is directly in the middle of this map. Much of the low ground adjacent to the Rhine had been flooded by breaching the dikes bordering the mighty river. For the Canadians advancing in this area, movement became a nightmare. Even with the, where the ground wasn't flooded, everything was a morass of mud and the campaign unfolded as a slow, hard slogging fight where ground was won, one foot at a time and at a terrible cost. The Rhineland campaign ended on March 10th. Canadian casualties during this campaign numbered 5,304. But a vital and largely today battle, forgotten battle had been won that provided 1st Canadian Army and 2nd British Army with an essential launching pad on the banks of the Rhine River that will serve for the advance into both Germany and the Netherlands and soon lead to ultimate victory. Operation Plunder, a forced crossing of the Rhine supported by a large airborne drop called Operation Varsity, began on March 23rd. For days, the battle raged as Germans tried to contain the, the beachhead one on their side of the Rhine. But slowly, the British and Canadian troops prevailed, the latter fighting their way into the ruins of Emmerich and then carrying the overlooking heights that had provided ideal artillery positions for the Germans. With Emmerich taken, the way was now open for Canadian forces to advance westward into the Netherlands, breaking into the country, not from the south as the Germans had expected, but from Germany itself over to the east. Consequently, by April the 1st, the Canadians are advancing rapidly in many different units, moving in many different directions through Eastern Holland, driving hard northward towards the North Sea in the provinces of Groningen and Friesland. Because the Netherlands is crisscrossed by many rivers, creeks, and canals, it's ideal country for defenders and terrible country for attackers, particularly due to the lack of terrain that provides cover during an advance. In addition, the Germans had inundated many areas of the uh, countryside uh, farmlands to confine First Canadian Army to the raised roads that ran along the top of the canals and river dikes. As, there were, as a result, there was much hard fighting, but advances still came rapidly. This is quite a famous photo. It's of the South Saskatchewan Regiment crossing into a town called Zutphen. First Canadian Corps was directed to begin fighting its way directly west from Arnhem 
and Zutphen, which we just saw, towards first Appledorn, and then on to the Greba line, a formidable defensive position that had been the last line of defense for the Dutch in 1940, and since then had been greatly strengthened by the Germans ever since. As the Canadians gained Appledorn, Seiss Inquart issued a warning that the Germans now trapped inside Western Holland, now called by them Fortress Holland, would open the dikes and flood the entire region unless the Canadians halted their advance. Cognizant of how badly things were beginning to slide towards disaster, the Dutch government had already opened a back channel to the German authorities. With Prince Bernard, pictured here, alongside 1st Canadian Corps Commander Lieutenant General Charles Folks, who will play a key role in this. It was a delicate situation. The Allied nations, including the Soviet Union, had decreed that Germany must surrender unconditionally. But here we have the Dutch discussing a ceasefire with Seiz Inquart, rather than a complete surrender, because Reich Commissar Seiz Inquart would not contemplate an ultimate surrender. Instead, the proposal was that when the Canadians reached the Greba line defenses, and you can see a town called Amersfoort in the top of the photo or the map here, um, and the, the little dotted lines running along there are the um, Greba line. The Germans, the proposal was simply when the Canadians reached that defensive line, they would simply stop. The Germans would stay within their defenses and take no offensive action along this line against the Canadians. At the same time, the Germans will stand aside and allow food supplies to pass through the lines and aerial drops would also be allowed. The Dutch initiative was soon condoned by the Allies, but the wrap talks were wrapped in the tightest cloak of secrecy. The highest level of secrecy in Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force, commonly known as SHAFE, was Bigot. Only staff who were given the designation bigoted were able to see highly classified reports and plans. Planning details of Operation Overlord, for example, had been considered bigoted. For what was codenamed Operation Mana, the aerial portion of the relief plan, and Operation Faust, the land portion, the classification was raised to more bigoted than bigot. Only a handful of military officers and staff were so classified. In late April, it became necessary to conclude the ceasefire agreement through direct face-to-face -face negotiations. Consequently, it was arranged for the German negotiators, ultimately including Seiss Inquart, to pass through the Canadian front lines in order to meet with al Allied representatives in the schoolhouse to the uh, right side of the photo in the village of Acterveld. It's about three miles east of Amersfoort. And the car you see in the center of the photo, uh, size Inquart has arrived in that. And um, there's some people walking towards the school in the background. That's the uh, German delegation going into the negotiation. Um, this is the only photo I think that has ever come out of that negotiations. And you can see it was taken clandestinely out of a window in a building off, 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 off across the street. These negotiations ultimately resulted in an unsigned agreement for a ceasefire and halt of hostilities at the Greba line and the flow of food into Western Holland. Operation MANA saw aerial drops by Canadian and British bomber crews on designated drop sites behind the German lines with supplies of mostly food that was then conducted by the Dutch resistance for distribution. That operation, Operation MANA, began on April 28th. On May 2nd, Royal Canadian Army Service Corps personnel began rolling through the German lines with trucks loaded full of food and other humanitarian supplies. It was a bizarre series of operations that saw the German troops in Western Holland guarding food for the Dutch that would be distributed by the resistance movement that they had been seeking to eliminate for years, and also standing aside as Canadian truckers moved back and forth through their lines. The food arrived just in time. Army authorities say that even a few days more delay would have resulted in a humanitarian crisis of massive proportions. The ceasefire also spared Western Holland being transformed into a nightmarish battlefield. There is no doubt that had the Canadians attempted to advance through the Greba line, 
and fight their way into the cities of Rotterdam, Amsterdam, Utrecht, and the like, that the Germans would have breached the dikes to flood the entire re region. Many Dutch civilians and probably Canadian soldiers would have died by drowning. There were 150,000 Germans still inside Fortress Holland, so they would have enjoyed numerical superiority priority of almost three to one over the Canadians and been able to entangle them in brutal street battles within the sprawling cities. Groningen had proved a, a tough nut to crack because it was so built up, but fighting for control of Rotterdam or Amsterdam would have been 10 times more of a challenge. The fighting in the central Netherlands city of Groningen proved to point with 204 Canadians killed or wounded enforcing the Germans out. This is an interesting photo because you see the Canadians are on the battle line actually fighting across a uh, dried out dike. And meanwhile, in the background around them, um, the Dutch citizens will all come out to greet them even as they're continuing to fight the battle. And this um, quite hampered the military operations. They were trying to keep the Dutch safe while still fighting uh, a very determined force of Germans. All during that sweetest of springs, of course, Canadians continued to die in combat elsewhere in the Netherlands, as the ceasefire only applied to the Grebel line. Then, north of Groningen, the last major engagement of the war fought by Canadians occurred, and the 5th Canadian Armoured Division collapsed the Delfzale pocket and eliminated the last German resistance on May 1st. On May 4th came the final ceasefire, followed by the surrender of German forces on May 5th. Fortress Holland's military commanders signed a surrender agreement in this hotel pictured here in Wageningen uh, that very day. The Canadian and Germans then faced another problem. How do you move 150,000 Germans from Holland back to Germany? This was dubbed Operation Eclipse. And here we see Canadian and German officers working together to try and figure out movement routes. News that the war was over was greeted with euphoria by the Dutch, but the mood among the Canadian troops was generally much more muted. Canadian casualties during those last 48 days of the war were 5,530 fatal, or about 5,530, of which 1,300 were fatal. Soon, Operation Eclipse was in full swing, whereby the Germans in large groups of several thousand men at a time marched across the Iselmere Causeway into Friesland, then through Groningen province and returned into Germany. For the Dutch, the occupation had been terrible. For the country's Jewish population, it had been devastating. 104,000 of 120,000 Jews in Holland perished in the extermination camps. And you can see Anne Frank in the photo there. She and her family were unfortunately on the last train that left Westerbork transit camp south of Groningen for the extermination camps in German. Another 23,000 Dutch died in Allied air raids on targets in their country. 5,000 were killed in German and camps and prisons. Another 2,800 were executed. 550,000 Dutch, mostly men, were forcibly shipped to Germany to work as slave laborers, and of those, 30,000 never returned. No, <clears throat> no conclusive tally of the numbers of Dutch who starved to death has ever been compiled, but it's estimated at about 20,000. Dutch authorities ultimately determined that 237,300 of its then population of 8 million died in World War II. When one looks at the suffering that all of Holland experienced in the occupation, it's possible to understand why, when their liberation came, there was such an outpouring of gratitude. And it's an outpouring of gratitude that exists to this very day, and I suspect it will always exist. In recent years, I've had the privilege of being in Holland for the remembrance ceremonies held every year on May 4th, which is their Remembrance Day. I visited many towns and monuments in large, uh, many monuments and towns that are large and small, and also spots out in the countryside where monuments mark the sacrifice of Canadian soldiers. 
Each one is lavishly decorated with wreaths and flowers. The highlight of Remembrance Day is the ceremony held each year here at Holton Canadian War Cemetery, where 1,355 Canadian soldiers are buried. As the time for the ceremony approaches, growing numbers of people filter into the cemetery and they take time to walk the rows of headstones and some with some moving to specific graves of significance to them. The Holden site was selected specifically by Lieutenant General Guy Simmons, who commanded 2nd Canadian Corps, because the location and the woodland it was in reminded him of countryside in central Ontario. When he requested this be the location for most of the Canadians killed in liberating Holland, the Dutch government immediately granted this tract of land in perpetuity to Canada. Ultimately, it proved too large for the actual number of graves required, and so extensive gardens that are maintained by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission were established. By the time the official ceremony begins, there are always well over a thousand people in the cemetery, which is interesting because Holton is actually quite isolated. It's not near any major Dutch communities. Always present are many school children who have been brought by bus and by their parents for the ceremony because they play a significant role in this act of remembrance. Each of the children set forth to lay small bouquets of yellow flowers, normally tulips, before each headstone. Some children have beforehand researched the soldier whose headstone they honor to find out as much as possible about him as an act of true remembrance. I like to remain behind after the crowds have dispersed to take photos of the headstones alone with the flowers. At the front of the central row we hear, you can, you can see that people all also placed small signs in front of the first two headstones. These were family members who came from Canada to participate in the ceremony and left markers, usually they're pictures of, of the uh, soldier who is killed and is lying here. In Canada, there's an upswell in recent years of remembrance of the sacrifices the Canadians have made, not just in World War II, but all conflicts, both past and current. We can only hope that such remembrance will continue to resonate in our country as it has always resonated in Holland and likely always will. This photo was taken a year ago at the um, British Columbia Legislature in Victoria, and you can see the cenotaph in the middle and the crowds there. Uh, typically, uh, two to 3,000 people show out, sometimes it's up to 5,000. Uh, depends on Victoria's fickle weather to some extent. And finally, that brings us to the little village of Ada in southern Holland. Here, I stopped to check out this bank tank monument on the town's outskirts once with a uh, small group of uh, Canadians on a tour. Suddenly, a group of children with their teacher arrived in appropriate Dutch manner on their bicycles. They had come specifically here for the teacher to discuss with them the liberation of their community in 1945. Our tour group handed out Canadian flags. Everyone was very pleased that we Dutch and Canadians were able to be at the tank monument at the same time. It's just another example of how the Dutch don't ever forget. Thank you. And there we are. I don't hear you. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> or not anymore. Here. Yes, now I'm hearing you. Okay. But now you I'm not. Me. Yes, now Thank I am. So much. Oh, Meredith, I don't think we can hear you. Yeah, you're you're sort of breaking up. <laughs> Give it a try. Uh, maybe if I mute my microphone. Hey, can anybody hear me now? Perfect. You're good now. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Can I couldn't hear anybody back. Can everybody hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, you're good now.
<laughs> I think you need to turn the headphones on. Can, can you hear me now? We're hearing you. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you now. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry about that, everybody. Just shows sometimes <laughs> things can go weird, even though it worked before. Um, so something I was wondering is if anybody had any questions um, regu regarding the presentation. I can, I actually don't mind starting. I actually have a question. Um, so I noticed that, you know, that they did use kind of like, they played around with the dike system to like, um, you know, flood the land. Was that mm -hmm. a tactic that they used in other regions as well? Like that, was that a common tactic? It was pretty common. Um, Holland just really lends itself to that. So, for example, they did do the similar kind of flooding down by Khan in the Normandy campaign. But Holland is so extensively reclaimed from the sea. You know, there's the old Dutch saying that the God created the earth and the Dutch created Holland. Um, and um, so they to create the farmland, you build a dike in a square or a rectangle around it, and that keeps the water out. So all the Germans had to do was just keep blowing up those dikes, and they, they could flood thousands and thousands of acres of land very rapidly. And they also blew up, um, there's pumps that keep a lot of these farmlands dry and they're pumping all the time. And so they blew up the pumps as well. And, and so there was no way of keeping the water out anymore. It took about, uh, I think it was a good 10 years for the Dutch to more or less recover from the flooding damage. My goodness, that's substantial. This is a long time. Mm -hmm. that's, well, that's it's, it's, it's salt water that's coming in. So the, the, the salt gets in the soil and, and then you have to re, redo the soil basically to, to make it so that you can grow stuff again. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you. D does anybody else have any other questions? Um, I do. Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Um, Mark, when you were studying and researching for your for your book, what was the most surprising thing that you found out, in your opinion? I think with the On to Victory book, what was surprising was the nature of the negotiation that went on between between the Canadians and and obviously Schaefe was involved in it at the upper level proving things and the Germans because it is, you know. And that they managed to keep it entirely secret, that nobody else knew besides the ones who had been bigoted, which were more bigoted, <laughs> um, that it, this was going on. And uh, so when I was doing the research, you come across um, really interesting documents that are the minutes of, of these um, of these discussions between the Germans and largely Canadians. There was an American there called Bettel Smith, who was representing Eisenhower, who was the commander of Schaaf. And then Prince Bernhard was there representing the uh, Dutch government. And so it was um, it was primarily a, a Canadian show and, and setting up, you know, OK, well, this is how we're going to bring relief to the, to the Dutch population. So that was pretty significant, I thought. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody have any other questions? I actually have one more question. I know you were talking about, you know, that they thought that they were kind of entering one area because there was like essentially like a miscommunication, I suppose, and that people lined the area. Was there any like punishment that went to those people that kind of were like there lining the area to welcome? Like, do you know? No, the uh, Germans at that point um, didn't actually persecute the the people who came out to demonstrate, but they um, they focused instead on on destroying the uh, infrastructure underneath. So you, know, you can come out and welcome the Canadians who don't show up, but we're, we're going to mess up your country uh, big time, and and that's what they they effectively did. So I see inquired, by the way, was was hanged for his his role in all of that. Um, and there's actually a classic moment in the um, minutes to the negotiation where um, Bettel Smith at one point getting angry at Sysinquart says, you know, you're going to hang for this. And Sysinquart says, that's cold. 
And Bettel, Bettel Smith says, you will be. So you, you get an idea of the tem ten temper of the uh, negotiations. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it sounds like a, sounds like there's a lot. It looks like we have another um, comment here. I'm just going to wait and see. They're typing. While we're waiting, if you, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, my wife's family is from the Netherlands, uh, from just outside uh, Amsterdam, and they lived through this uh, this unfortunate period in history. Um, my question is more to do with I know the Americans were involved in the Marshall Plan and the rebuilding. Uh, uh, and trying to get uh, certain sections of Europe back uh, back up to a livable standard. Because of our close connection, being Canadians, um, close with the Dutch, was the Canadian government uh, able to provide additional resources to help the Dutch people get back on their feet? Not and the so second, much. And the second thing, mm -hmm. if I can, mm -hmm. two-part question. Sure. Is I know that the my own family, uh, being British, was involved in many years of rationing after the Second World War. Um, I would take it that the Dutch uh, also experienced some. And how long did that go on before they were somewhat at a level of self-sufficiency? So um, the um, on the first one. Uh, the Canadian government itself wasn't particularly involved in helping with reconstruction, but um, we had the Canadian army in Holland after the war ended. And they, it's not until actually early 1946 that the last Canadians leave, actually it was late, late 1946, that the last Canadians leave Holland to go back to Canada because there's a shortage of shipping and so um, they're moved out slowly and while the Canadians were there they were um, billeted effectively in uh, communities all over Holland and uh, because they were trying to maintain some semblance of military discipline uh, they were usually the units were quite involved in in reconstruction within that community rebuilding uh, helping to restore the dikes um also we had the the you know, there's an enormous amount of engineering ability within within a military unit uh, the engineers so they were working actively with the dutch to restore things so moving over to the rationing side of things yes the dutch um were under rations for a long time in um uh, to the point that uh, in the through the 1950s and into the early 1960s, the Dutch government was actively encouraging immigration out of Holland, uh, the Netherlands, uh, to other countries, primarily the United States, Canada, and Australia, to a limited degree, uh, but particularly a lot of a lot of Dutch um, young, particularly young men. Uh, immigrated to uh, Canada in that period and uh, in fact a little village I grew up in in uh, the British Columbia interior Falkland uh, probably I would say 15 to 20 percent of the population when I was growing up there were uh, Dutch families that had come over in that in that period we also have a comment from Margaret she said um, I, too, had the honor of witnessing the 75th celebration of the liberation. It was so moving. The stories I heard were bone chilling, unbelievable and heartwarming. It is a trip I will never forget. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we're going to be doing it again ourselves. Uh, I work with a company called Liberation Tours, um, and we're not the only company. There's others in Canada that are going to be all going over in uh, late April, early May for the 80th anniversary of Ooh. the liberation of the Netherlands, which the, the Dutch government is, is organizing and Dutch communities are organizing. Uh, so they're going to have a lot of celebrations and ceremonies. We'll be attending quite a bit of those. So it's a great uh, opportunity. Yeah, it sounds like it would be a really powerful, um, powerful time to go there and see everything. It, it, uh, Margaret also said, I'm looking forward to the 80th that I hope to attend as well. So maybe great. Margaret will be there as well. That would be great. Yeah. Does anybody have any other questions? 
once again, I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Uh, I've yeah. been involved in two school trips. Um, one was the uh, 100th anniversary of uh, the, um, I'd say the World War I major battle that the Canadians were involved in. Um, big monument there. Uh, oh, Vim, Vimy. Vimy, yeah. yeah. Mm. So the 100th anniversary of that in 2017. And then the second one that I was involved in was the um, anniversary uh, of D-Day, which was two years later in 19, uh, 2019. Fantastic time. Um, my wife and I go over to the Netherlands usually every other year. She has relatives there. Um, one thing I would like to encourage, which I've done in the past, is that you can apply or go to your local MP MP's office and get small Canadian flags, buttons, sort of thing, and then take a number of them across to the Netherlands if you go on these and hand them out to the children and to others. And they are very receptive and very respectful for Canadians. So it just strengthens our relationship with that country and what we're honored to have uh, with regard to the hand that we played in liberation. Yes, and I can uh, testify to that same thing. The, uh, the the little flags, you know, whether the last photo with the the ones that the kids, um, yeah, they're always very receptive to that kind of thing, and, and um, they, and it's really interesting that in the you know that was just a small school, um, and a teacher talking to them, the kids about well, this is what happened in our community at the, in in 1944 when they when they liberated our community and and uh, so you know that, that whole remembrance thing is is being passed down through, at all different levels in the within the country. We also have another comment from Suzanne. She said, "My grandfather served with the Royal Canadian Engineers, and he often said that even though he went days without eating." His hunger was nothing compared to the suffering of the Dutch people. Yes. Um, it's pretty eye-opening how much mm -hmm. that Yeah, much yeah and a, a lot of them were uh, giving almost their entire amount of rations to the Dutch as they went by, you know, through these communities and that. And, uh, oh, just a little segue, uh, Wolf Gildersleeve, and who I mentioned, and uh, Marguerite Ruhrs, uh, the Dutch girl who went out to meet him, uh, and they, they met each other in, in Amsterdam there. Um, they do get married and, oh. uh, and, and uh, live, live happily ever after in uh, North Vancouver, British Columbia. And if you ever watch those on television, the Heritage Minutes that come up, there's actually one about them. Uh, oh, lovely, yeah. lovely. I suppose like a little anecdote on my part, but not as good, I, I guess. Um, some family lore of mine is my grandfather actually was part of the liberation of the Netherlands as well. Um, and he actually fell in love with somebody and he wanted her to come here and she didn't come. So that was always like the love of his life that didn't. Right. Didn't come. Well, because they um, yeah, so, um, they had that they had that year yeah, and a half exactly. kind of <laughs> yeah because they had that yeah. year and a half when they were in Holland waiting to come home. Um, uh, there were an awful lot of uh, of relationships that developed, of course. Yeah, not surprising. We also have a comment from William it says, "My father, a captain for the Lynx, fought in the Netherlands and is mentioned in two of your books." Oh, great! <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Perfect. Well, I don't know. Does anybody have any other questions? Well, on behalf of myself and the Simcoe County Museum, Mark, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Um, this was a very informative uh, presentation. It was a great topic to learn about, especially coming up to the 80th um, later in next year. So it is good to know about it. I, I see Mary Frances is also taking this off. Read her comment when she's done. Um, but for everybody here, I just wanted to let you know that we do have another presentation next week and the week after. So it's every Thursday at 1 p.m. So next week it is Michael Moore and he is talking about, or Moyer, sorry. And he's talking about Collingwood and the transition from wooden to steel shipbuilding from 1880 to 1916. And it actually sets up for how we transitioned into the steel ships that we started to produce here in Collingwood. So we have Barry Francis has said, thank you for this information. And then I'm just going to wait because Margaret's also typing uh, something. Sure. 
I was curious, actually, when they, because I know, like, the big thing, I'm pretty sure it's the, with the Netherlands, like, the whole tulip aspect. Do you see a lot of tulips, like, near the Canadian memorial area, or? Yes. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. It, it's, it's, the, it's the flower of choice that gets laid on all the monuments uh, on November 4th yeah. and 5th. Um, and usually that, sometimes there's roses, but mostly it's it's tulips. Yeah, that makes sense. So, oh, Margaret was just letting me know that it shows as general mountain time for time. Oh, for the presentation. For, yeah. Is it for this presentation, Margaret? Because I know that Mark is in Victoria, so that might be kind of what is changing it. Oh, all of them. I'm not too sure why that is, so I will look into <laughs> it. It's 1 p.m. on our time. So if you join us 1 p.m. next week, um, we'll have another presentation and then we'll have another one. The next Thursday to follow, so I will uh, I will update that. So thank you for letting me know. Um, but yeah, once again, thank you for uh, joining us. It was definitely really informative, and some of it was very eye opening. It's uh, it's very important information for us to know. Um, and then Margaret also said thank you. So thank you. Thank you. you. Well, thank, thank you, you for having me, and uh, you have a good rest of your day. Yes, you as well. Thank you. Thanks.